Rage Against the Machine has become the machine. Yeah. I'm the revolutionary and Rage Against the Machine is just government rock. I'm not accepting no prep school, Bell Air bread sellout into my fraternity. Oh, you can stop all no, that. No, wait, Will. I got this one. You think I'm a sellout, why? Because I live in a big house where I dress a certain way? That's only the beginning. You too can learn to walk flat. No, 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 no rhythm. Observe. Yes, yes, yes. And then they use religion against you. You think because you're making money or it's easy on you that God has blessed you. That's a lie. If I've taken all the resources on this earth and you start acting the way that I want you to act and I give you a little bit of your resources back, and you think you think uh, uh, there's a connection between your prayers and you getting a couple of those resources back, that's some bullshit. Have you ever <laughs> caught backlash from your name? Yes, all the time. Everybody's just like, you know, the history of it. But I'm like, look, you guys need to understand that like, it, like you can't just make it about that. Like I'm literally just like, this is, I love gorillas. I love gorillas and I, I dance. And you, if you guys are making it more than it is, it's just like, it, you don't, it doesn't have to be that, you know what I mean? Like, right. yes, like the, the history, the past of people calling us gorillas or monkeys. Yes, I understand, but this is a new era. This is the future. Let's like, you know, move forward into a new generation. And I guess I'm still on your little team, but I'm playing from the bench. The bench where you sit and get your bills paid. You know my uncle's about to lose his house. Tash, I'm sorry about your uncle, man, but that don't mean sell out. I'm not selling y'all out. My success has nothing to do with you, all right? Meh. I learned something about myself tonight, kid. It ain't comedy that's in my blood. It's selling out. Come on, I'll give you a ride home. Yes, this is a video about the 2018 film, Sorry to Bother You. And because of that, it's also a video about code switching at work, Reaganomics, the labor class, company towns, slavery, labor unions, and protests. Just imagine if everything everywhere all at once was actually as good as every hipster ass fake deep liberal pretended it was. Oh, she was a cartoon in one, in one universe. Oh, okay. Guess what? Homer Simpson went to the third dimension 25 years ago on Treehouse of Horror before the movie. It's not that impressive, nerd. So if you somehow discovered this video but expecting a review for a movie that came out six years ago, okay, you have a very strange YouTube algorithm, but stick around. And also, this video is brought to you by my Patreon and YouTube member subscribers. And if this video seems familiar for some reason, it's because it's a spiritual successor to FD Signifier's video, Spike Lee Tried to Warn Us. And if you haven't watched that one, it's fine. You, you can watch it after mine. Seriously. It, it can wait. It has like 700,000 views. Bamboozle centers around one Pierre Delacroix. 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 Wayans is also part of one of the most prominent black families in Hollywood, the Wayans, who have worked independently in Hollywood for decades now, though probably most famous at the time for the black comedy sketch show and live in Living Color. Wayans as Delacroix doesn't make any sense. His real name, first off, is not Pierre Delacroix, it's Peerless Dothan. What are you gonna do, Peerless? And Wayans gives him this ridiculous speaking voice and mannerisms that are explicitly not black coded. <laughs> now, I have been doing a lot of soul searching. Okay. And once again, you're right. My previous work has been all surface, superficial. Had I been informed of this very important staff meeting, I would have canceled my Pilates session this morning. No, I'm not trying to ride this wave. I got his blessings about this video. But anyway, around three years ago when I first made my YouTube channel and I struggled to get like 200 people to watch a video in a month. Three of my earliest videos were Robert Townsend's 1987 film, Hollywood Shuffle, Spike Lee's 2000 film, Bamboozle, which I felt was a spiritual successor, and then Sorry to Bother You, which I felt was the third movie in my mind canon trilogy. Honestly, those videos, they were bad. The pacing was awful. I was reading off the cue cards in between takes but some of you still enjoy them. Now they either got copyright blocked or I just took them down 
And also, I feel like I can do a lot better. But before we can talk about Sorry to Bother You, we have to talk about the other two movies and what I'll call the sellout trilogy. Think of it as your grandfather told your dad a story, your dad told you the same story, and now you tell the story to your children. Meaning, if we can get enough black directors to keep this up in like 20 years, it'll be a tax-free religion based around movies. Because as we all know, fictional stories plus enough time equals a religion. I mean, that's how L. Ron Hubbard did it with his nut-ass sci-fi books. And all they had to do was a blackmail the IRS and boom, Scientology is a religion. He had many enemies. Wasn't L. Ron Hubbard a science fiction writer? Yes, but he was also a prophet who knew the secret truth about the nature of life. This is just too much. We want to reveal to Stan the great secret of life behind our church, the safely guarded Scientology doctrine. Please, your son- Oh, oh, the religion joke, that, that was too far? Okay, I want you to keep that same energy next time I make fun of rednecks who are afraid of big cities. Okay, so back to the same story three times. The theme will be the same, but because of generations, it'll be differences. And also, Feek, I know you're watching. Uh, sorry, OG, for making you a pops in this scenario. Niggas already calling you unk like you be wearing linen suits and Stacey Adams on the weekends anyway. What you say now, Chuck? <laughs> Right on. <laughs> what, what, what you say, not Chuck? <laughs> but for those not familiar, in the words of Prim to Cinema, Robert Townsend is a black all star. His first film is 100% self funded and low key autobiographical of his frustrations and journeys as a black creator in the 1980s, where only roles for black people in movies was pimps or street hoods, unless, of course, you was a mega star. And thanks to the Tubi app, which is literally owned by right-wing vampires at Fox. Black movies and shows low-key come back to that bullshit. Okay, so anyway, in the movie, Robert gets a big role as a pimp gangster or some shit, but the whole time he has this battle with his inner conscience of enforcing negative black stereotypes while also wanting to make it as an actor. And also, if he doesn't do it, someone else will take the role. Eventually, he's like, nah, I can't sell out like that. He walks off the set and gets a job as a mailman. He even ends up doing a commercial for the post office. That's a super Cliff Notes version of the movie, but go watch it for yourself. That's the super Cliff Notes version of the movie plot. Go go watch it for yourself. What am I? <laughs> no, never mind. Uh, I originally, I was going to diss a specific YouTuber. Y'all know the YouTube channel set. They just give you a beat by beat recap for movies and shows, but I don't want that to hurt nobody's feelings and smack the shit out of one of these niggas. <laughs> they run up on me cosplaying as a Power Ranger or something. All right, so second movie in the sellout trilogy is Bamboozle. It's a playbook of sorts that she called the Mantan Manifesto. This list is one of the reasons why this movie is still so relevant 20 years later. The goal of it was to give Delacroix enough tools and enough ways to spin and avoid criticism from the obvious awfulness that they were doing to make sure that if anybody ever came on the attack, he would know what to say. The Mantan Manifesto reads as follows. One. We gainfully employ African Americans in front of and behind the camera. Two. Let the audience decide. Three. Who put these critics in charge anyway, right? Right. Four. Who determines what is black? Yeah, what is black? Five. Mantan is a satire. Six. If they can't take a joke, you know what? F them. Yeah, F them. And seven. This show was created and conceived by you, right? a non-threatening African-American male. So the show can't be racist because you're black. One of Spike Lee's best movies. It stars Damon Wayans as Pierre de la Croix, a writer who wants to make black shows that's something different than niggas in a project selling drugs and dreams of being rappers. You know, to be shit. His white boss ain't feeling this, so he decides to make the most racist show ever so he'll get fired and receive his severance. Only one thing, he forgot this is the year 2000 in America. People don't understand satire or have media literacy. It's a huge success. Thanks to his two black actors, he hires that wear actual blackface and perform menstrual acts. Because of the fame and fortune, De La Croix becomes a full sellout. Yada yada, one of the Mr. Show brothers quits. Another shot days later by a group of black hotips. Damon Wayans gets shot. Seriously. 
Go check out the video after this and also the entire movie. Which brings us to the third movie in the trilogy, Sorry to Bother You. Okay, I'm four months late, but check this out. Damn, God made this land for all of us. And greedy people like you want to hog it to yourself and your family and charge all the rest of us for the right to live. Me and my family? Yeah. Cassius, I'm your fucking uncle. It was released 18 years later, directed by Boots Riley. Okay, so let me be honest with you. This is like my fourth time talking about this movie on YouTube. First was a super bad essay. The second was okay, but got copyright blocked. The third one was only like eight minutes long on my other channel. And it also got copyright blocked like a month later. Uh, so two things. Y'all won't be getting many clips. And also, this is going to have mad spoilers. I know you're thinking, come on, John. It's a movie about selling out or capitalism, whatever you dreadhead niggas always talking about. All right, well, I tried to warn you. Sorry to Bother You is the directorial debut of Boots Riley. Boots is also a rapper from the group The Coop. Imagine if you took Most Def, Taleb Kweli, and sprinkled some Kendrick Lamar. He's also a communist, pro-labor radical. I'll say this. The left has avoided the class struggle for the last 60 years. Hmm. And I'm talking about not just the liberals, not just the progressives, the radical left itself as well has avoided, has, has avoided the class struggle for the last 60 years. Um, and, and to discuss that, you got to go back. And, and, and so, so since the 60s, since the beginning of the new left and mm. to discuss why that happened, you have to go back before that. And I'm trying to get better y'all. I was going to, I had a joke in here. And I was going to say, he's what a certain nerd fake skateboard rapper from Chicago pretends to be, but that's in bad taste. Okay. But the story is about Cassius Green. He broke his heel, so his man gets him a job at the call center with him, selling encyclopedias and all type of nonsense no one really needed in 2018 when this movie dropped. But the company be on some, it's all commission type bull jive with the pay and working conditions, so... They try and form a union so everyone can get better pay. Thing is, Cassius is really good at selling because he discovers his white boys and soon gets promoted to the upper level. Will Cassius stay part of the fight or be a sellout? All right, you caught up. Now we can officially start. And this video, again, is brought to you by my, by my supporters on Patreon. If skill so truthy told, I'd probably be lyrically Talib Kweli. I want to rhyme like common sense, but I did five mil. I ain't been rhyming like common sense. That's Jay-Z on the record, Moment of Clarity, on the Black Album, arguably one of his best albums. While I haven't sold five million albums or whatever the YouTube equivalent of that is, I guess 500 million views, maybe, I have diluted my content and seen positive results. Early in 2023, I made one of the most raw video essays on American prisons you'll find done by someone without major connections to celebrities and politicians. Hell, even bigger YouTubers. Niggas be ghosting me when I try and collab and get interviews, but it's bull. I'm keeping a list. So anyway, I interviewed my man's Les, a felon who talked about all the small things we don't think about, like not getting visits when you hours or a few states away from your family to having to get your hustle on to get everyday items like soda and chips and restitution some inmates have to pay out of their own commissary budget i interviewed my man's rock out in brooklyn who lived through the height of stop and frisk him and his mom going to visit his brother in the penitentiary for years how that affects the entire family not just the one during the time like your mother she she might have a um a bra on that got a wire in it she might have to take that bra off just to see her loved one. She might have a, a, a ring on her finger that she ain't take off for 20 years, but right. she got to beat that metal detector, so she have to take it off. And I done seen people, they had they drive two, three hours to a, a, a jail. You know, they, them jails, they in isolated areas. They in off nasty highways and creeks. Mm -hmm. So if you don't got the right attire, you won't have to drive to a Walmart, get you a shirt, jeans, sweats, whatever. Like, it's no joke, man. It, I interviewed a child psychologist on what seeing and arrest and jail visits do to a child. 
I even talked about my own experience and my earliest memories of my brother being in the visiting room for seven year bid. And you know what? That video flopped. Honestly, it had about less than half the views it does if Lil Bill and Feek didn't post about it. But I had to realize the same thing Jay-Z did. Skills don't sell alone. So about 10 months later, when I did a video about how broken policing is in America, yes, I was much better on camera. Yes, I hired an editor, but I had to tone it down and add some jokes and clips to TV shows. And in a week, that got that video got like 30,000 views. Amazing for a channel my size. So in a sense, I sold out. That raw shit wasn't working. If it was rap, that video would have been like scaring the hoes music. You know what I'm saying? Something like... Talib Kweli, MF Doom, or Most Deaf. Hey, ain't nobody trying to hear that bullshit, oh, man. Fuck, fuck, shut fuck, fuck, you fuck, shut you up. Even if you think them brothers can rap, that's not what you cut on to get people in a chill vibe and women dancing. But that's the game. If I want to grow my channel, increase views, get spam, get sponsors, afford to pay an editor, and hopefully stack enough to build a decent savings. I gotta play the game. And unless you've had an overnight blow up from one video, the thing any content creator understands by the time they knock it on like 20,000 subscribers is, it's about what the audience wants and what they've come to expect from you. And also the culture of YouTube. I'm not the guy y'all come to for data breakdowns on how locking up black men destroys communities or, or how conservative American views are inherently anti-black. If I want to talk about it, I need to wrap it up in packaging about a movie or show. Either that or go complain about how the algorithm is suppressing me or something. Listen, it's entertainment. Chances are you're letting this video play while you help your spouse cook dinner, you driving home, or you on your lunch break. It's a reason the same people who make two hour long videos complaining every time Kenya Bears or Tyler Perry drop a project they do that because negativity gets views on YouTube. It's the reason you don't see them talking about shows like I'm a Virgo, another Boots Riley project, making video essays about rap shit, Godfather of Harlem, hell, not even Southside, despite them all telling black stories from different perspectives like they claim they want. And also, on the point of content creators complaining about mediocre black shows, black creators should be allowed to make mediocre content you telling me two pro girls with some groundbreaking show that ran for God's know how long? You all love to hate watch. And if I'm being honest, a majority of those people aren't as interested in black stories as they claim to be or I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Most of these creators in this space are Gen Z or younger millennials, not black Americans or they had a fly in the milk experience and I don't understand them anyway. They come off like the sports analytic nerds where us who actually enjoy basketball might talk about Anthony Edwards' potential to be the face of the NBA once LeBron retires. The analytic nerds want to talk about plus minus when he's on the court and point differential. Daryl set out to find that winning formula. The Rockets were one of four NBA teams to install a pioneering video tracking system which mined raw data from games. What they discovered changed the way teams tried to win. The data revealed which shots provided the best bang for buck. Two-point dunks and three-pointers shot from outside the three-point line rather than long-range two-point shots from inside it. It's the same, not all, it's the same with some video essays on YouTube. They don't actually enjoy movies as entertainment or finding shows they like to watch. It's a reason in 2023 your favorite creators all had messages about being in solidarity with the SAG after strikes. While I have no issue with that, how many of them mentioned the major UAW strikes or blue collar auto workers in Detroit and other cities? Another manufacturing jobs. 
which ended up being one of the biggest wins for labor in the past couple of decades. Several gates right outside Ford, Michigan is simply, they're empty. Workers were told to go home. They're certainly celebrating, so you could call it a celebratory quiet here at Ford, Michigan Assembly, right outside the UAW Local 900. Let's go to some video right now from earlier. Now, this video is essentially the only, the last video of strike activity you will likely ever see here, at least this time around, at Ford, Michigan Assembly in Wayne. This was hours before workers got the news of a tentative agreement between Ford and the UAW, and uh, it's a 25% increase over the lifetime of this tentative agreement with cost of living adjustment. That's about 30% of an increase there. It's been six weeks. The union pushing for double-digit wage increases, job security, and an end to tears. And tonight, the UAW went online, posted a video, the union saying they have a tentative agreement with Ford and or the fact strikes by union workers jumped by 280 percent from 2022 to 2023. I want you all to tap in with the YouTube channel More Perfect Union for people that are really supporting unions and dropping chins. But the thing is, it's the spectacle of protest and solidarity. People are more interested, rather they know it or not. Also, the people who make long ass video essays tend to come from backgrounds. They never really had to work a blue collar factory job or anything related. So they only learn about working class struggle from the internet or TV shows. But as the saying goes, the game is the game. Now, we still yet to answer the question, what is a sellout? Now, normally this is where I tell all my non-black viewers especially white folk y'all gotta relax in the comments but the idea of selling out is something i would say white americans actually have a long tradition in hear me out if you grew up on mtv in the 2000s or earlier in black you understand what we call white people music it wasn't an insult shit niggas fuck with panic at the disco fallout boy maroon five till this day but by the time they reached the heights to make it on MTV TRL, at least a loud minority of the day one fans considered them sellouts simply because they on the same show as Backstreet Boys and NSYNC with Screaming Teen Girls. And I realize that show hasn't been relevant in like 15 years or more. I gotta explain how big TRL was. For Tina, it was a show for teenagers mostly, teenage girls honestly. They are the ones who decide what pop music is whether you want to admit it or not. TRO came on five days a week for like three hours a day and could literally change a band's career just by their music video being on the list. The channel Punk Rock NBA has a ton of videos on that whole era and everything. Now, honestly, I can't blame those original fans. I hated TRL. All the white people music I knew was from like video games and early morning MTV videos. Damn, man. I I just got hit with a dose of teenage nostalgia. All right, my, my bad, I'm back on track. Also, I'm black and I was 13 when 50 Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying came out in 2003. So I was in the 106 in Park, which was basically the black TRL. Sorry, just sit down and, and try nah, to- Nah, I don't even, okay. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't mention him if they mm -hmm. didn't mention him to me. Okay. What if it was? What if it wasn't on air? What if it was an interview that was off air and it was you? I all, love to, It wasn't an interview. It was really just like a behind discussion. the scenes. I meet Minister Farrakhan anytime, you know. And what about Mr. Farrakhan and Job? Bishop Eddie Long, huh? Minister Farrakhan and Job yeah. behind doors. Would you do that? I'm not interested in meeting okay. Ja Rule. Right, like, okay. We're never gonna be friends. Okay. Yeah. You know? Yet these artists, that's still not a sellout. That's just going mainstream and getting your money right. The reason I say white America has a different relationship with selling out is because. As a black person in America, you understand at a very young age, your genuine self might scare the shit out of white people. And if you an entertainer, that can hurt your money. So when the guy who made How to Rob has a more radio friendly record, like in the club, we understand. It's even a badge of honor. Like, yeah, man, I was on the 50 Cent, Meek Mill, or Nipsey Hussle before they blew up and had all these ESPN commercials. The game is the game, which is what we see with the character of Cassius Green. He does whatever he needs to do to get legal employment. 
He broke his heel, living in his uncle's garage, driving his uncle's raggedy car in hopes of making enough money to pay his share of rent. And he does at least get a job at this call center for a company called Regal View, selling any, anything, pretty much anything to pay the bill. But it's at this point we discover Cassis has a gift. As the black old head working next to him explains, he needs to use his white voice. And just so y'all know, YouTube gets weird about copyright for black movies, so I might not be able to use any of the clips I want for this video. Like I said, I've had two different videos get straight up blocked. All right, so the old head tells him he has to use his white voice. It's not really a white voice. It's what they wish they sounded like. So it's like what they think they're supposed to sound like. Like this young blood. Hey, Mr. Kramer, this is Langston from Regal View. I didn't catch you at the wrong time, did I? And Cass is so talented. It's like a puppet master using a little puppet man. And boom, old Cass is green is finally able to make sales off this commission only job. Now, in the hands of a bad director, this whole scene could have been handled badly. Like when bread tubers claim turfs all had the same I identify as an attack helicopter joke. Then they go on and make the same. White people be pale, don't they? Don't white people be pale? Joke every other bread tuber has made. They even lampshade this with Cassius Green doing a 1990s death comedy jam, White Voice, before they switch over to the voice dub that characters in the movie here. So some of you like, oh, I, I got it. The cold switching for work. That's what you mean. And for people not hip, cold switching is a tactic non-white people, mostly black folks, use in professional settings, also known as the job interview voice. But no, that's not selling out either. We all do different things to survive and constantly putting on the performance, as Danny Glover, who plays the old head, explains. It's not really a white voice. It's what white people think they should sound like. Having everything figured out, bills paid, you just calling us a friend, not a care in the world. Now, Throughout the movie, it's all kinds of side stories and commentary going on that I'll be offering my interpretation of because it's art. We see commercials and ads for a company we'll learn more about later. It's called Worry Free, and they offer lifetime contracts. You don't get paid, but you have a place to live. They feed you. You just need to work a full shift every day. The United States government actually sides with the company Worry Free that it's not slavery because no one forces them to sign under the threat of violence. Worry Free's method of lifetime labor contracts is a new form of slavery. Worry Free CEO Steve Lift was interviewed on Oprah today. No, conclusively no. Our workers do not sign contracts under threats of physical violence. So therefore the comparison to slavery is just ludicrous and offensive. They even have propaganda commercials showing happy employees Remember like how a decade ago, all the tech companies was like, oh, this, this isn't a workplace, it's Amazon, a giant campus, we got ping pong balls and Nintendo Wii and a boss has a Nerf gun. And I just, I just realized ping pong balls and Nintendo Wii is the same mind. In fact, they actually begin to replace sweatshops in third world countries, which yes, it's good because sweatshops have awful work conditions, but they just replace something bad with another type of bad. Boots Riley talks about this in an interview speaking about black capitalism. Not have capitalism without poverty. It needs it. You cannot have capitalism without unemployment. If you, if everyone was, if there was full employment, 100% employment, no one could get fired because there'd be no one to replace them. Even furthermore, if you had 100% uh, uh, employment, uh, people that work someplace could just demand higher wages without even having a union struggle. They need the army of unemployed workers to keep uh, wages down. And now to explain poverty to people in a way that's not systematic, they need to put a behavioral pattern on poverty. One way to do that is to say, look at these others. Look what they do. This is what keeps them poor when even white workers look at themselves as being poor. They, they look at themselves in terms of not wanting to act like black folks. Now, 
We all for black people getting the buck and trying to provide for themselves. Hell, I have a family member that owns his own business and employs a couple other family members. One being a felon who have a much more difficult time finding a job anywhere else. That's not the issue. When we start talking about black banking, tech, studios, etc., we're just replacing capitalism with another type of capitalism. It's also a popular show that gets over 150 million views a night called I Got the Shit Kicked Out of Me, where the contestants go on, get humiliated seemingly for no purpose. O'Hare straight up says he enjoys it because it makes him feel better about himself. So it's really no righteous people in this movie. Keep all of that in mind. It, it's going to come up later. Okay, so the homie squeezed from their job. He's fed up with low pay and them all getting taken advantage of, so he organized a work stoppage. And this ain't Squeeze's first rodeo. He seemingly travels across the country doing these types of things. He organized the first Science Vendors Union. Yeah, Science Vendors, that's outside buildings, you know what I'm saying, doing tricks with the cardboard, which sounds ridiculous in 2024. But it was a time in America when union membership was a lot higher. And that caused every other job to offer competitive wages. And now for a quick side quest on the death of unions in America. Trust me, it's worth it. I've been there for years. Since Ronald Reagan kicked me out of my mental hospital. The crippling of unions in America is thanks to easily the worst president in America's history. Considering what he did to the America's economy and the middle class. That's triple six, Ronald Wilson Reagan. I'm trying to explain to you that Ronald Reagan was the devil. Ronald Wilson Reagan? Each of his names has six letters? Six, six, six? And also, what he did to PATCO, better known as the Air Traffic Controllers Union. You know the people that make sure we don't have a Breaking Bad incident? And, oh, I'm sorry, a 15-year spoiler for Breaking Bad Season 3. Well, the Air Traffic Controllers, they demanded... A raise and also a reduction from 40 to 32 hours because of how stressful the job is now if the people that make sure planes don't fly into each other are saying we need to work less hours because of stress you should probably listen considering that you know make sure planes don't fly into each other but because these were federal employees, it's illegal for them to strike. Yes, non-Americans, this country is that fucked up. But 13,000 employees went on strike. Anyway, old Ronnie Reagan said, well... I brought my rep in Ronnie Reagan tape. It always makes the trip go faster. Well, 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 then followed up with laws to make it easier to break up unions across America, introduced some bullshit called Reaganomics, which essentially means less taxes on corporations and the mega rich, under the belief that it would encourage them to make new companies and buy more cars and restaurants? I don't know. After a sharp rise of computer science degrees and jobs in the late 70s, the job availability peaked in 1984 and would continue to decline for the next 10 years. For the blue collar workers, many of the remaining factories were modernizing and thinning their workforces. Noted experts in 1984, previously in a more stable competitive environment, U.S. manufacturing companies would lay off workers with the least seniority in a downturn and re-employ them when economic conditions improved. Now, companies were much more likely to Shutter whole plants. What was the result? By the 1990s, a majority of union manufacturing jobs had left America. A large amount of those were in urban neighborhoods, meaning a black and brown man with no college education or, in some cases, no high school education could get a stable, well paying job to provide for the family. That was gone. This really hit 
America, like the Rust Belt, but specifically black men all across the country. And around this time, something called crack cocaine just so happened to blow up in black communities and offer you the chance to get rich overnight. But if you didn't want to do that, what type of jobs replaced your manufacturing jobs? Well, in the 1980s, 19 million jobs were created in that decade, but 75% of those were low-wage service and retail jobs. By the 1990s, Walmart showed up and the rise of what some writers call mech jobs or minimum wage service jobs. Just think of it as the gig economy of the 1990s and instead of wearing down your car delivering Chick-fil-A for three different food apps, you worked in a mall at a hot dog on a stick stand. Now realizing this is 2024, for the sake of Gen Z, I guess I should explain what a shopping mall is. <laughs> I'm, I'm fucking with y'all. The 1990s was either feast or famine, while urban black areas were ravaged with the removal of stable mid-class labor jobs replaced with low-paying service jobs. Thanks to the tech boom of the 90s, America made more millionaires and billionaires than any other time, but no proof whatsoever of the trickle-down economics. Turns out if you're given the option to hoard money and or buy real estate, rich people would rather do that instead of opening a second inline skating shop. Man, I don't know. I was a kid in the 90s. I don't know what the hell Reaganomics was supposed to do or what he imagined. I didn't make up the dumb idea. But yes, the 90s were good for a lot of Americans, especially compared to the 80s. People were getting raises, profit sharing, but according to experts, without Ronald Reagan, the pendulum was going to swing that way anyway, and it would have done that without taking a huge hit to the middle class. I say all this to set up a picture for how a guy like our protagonist, who's not lazy and has a great work ethic, ends up working for a shitty company like he has in the movie. And for way more info on the topics I had to speed run through, I recommend the book The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander and also the YouTube channel Lectual Media. Her series Lex Does the 80s and Lex Does the 90s is amazing. I used her study guide I bought for some research. So now, Squeeze has everyone riled up. He warns some upper management will try and single people out during the work stoppage. And boom, we at the office and it happens. Everyone stopped dialing, including Cassis. Management is pissed, but the message is sent. And like Squeeze said, Cassis is taken to the office expecting to be fired. He curses them out. They're like, nah, bro, you're being promoted as a power caller. I hope y'all actually watch this movie because it's so much I can't show or this video will get taken down like I'm hella paranoid for even using any clips. Anyway, he quite literally moves up in the same building he works in just to get the elevator. Just for the elevator to move up, the white woman that escorts him, she needs a legit 30 number passcode that's so long it has to be written down on a piece of paper. Now to me, that was Boots, the director way of saying for a black man to move up from working class to a better class status, it's a code that's almost impossible to learn. We then learn Worry Free sells actual slave labor and weapons of mass destruction to other countries. Now, before Cass can turn the job down, they show him the starting salary, an amount we don't see as an audience. And this is when the movie makes a real turn, and also the scene a lot of people who've never watched this movie know out of context, like usually thanks to Twitter, is known as the polite argument. Fantastic. Fantastic. I hope you have a good day. Hope you have a better week. Mm, I hope your month is full of successful days and a lot of great ventures. I hope you just come up, brother. I hope your whole fucking year is spectacular. Oh, you hope my year is spectacular? Yeah. You got something you want to say? You got something you want to say? But between all that, Cass says something important that he's not a sellout. He can still root for them from the sideline, but he needs to get paid because his uncle is about to lose his house, which is really understanding and why I wanted to remake this video. And also, the idea came from a few things. First, I wanted to talk about this movie again, and another was a behind the scene conversation with some other black creators. 
And someone made a good point that selling out is a slow process. It happens without you even realizing it because you're just trying to survive. You see that in the movie and from Boots Riley interviews, real life. So just some personal info on me. I do this YouTube thing part-time. I have a full-time job. I've been working jobs since I was 17. So I don't exactly see the world the same as some of these younger black political creators. That's not a diss, it's just I don't understand. Listen, people have to pay bills. Now, I'm not taking a better help sponsorship if they offered it because it's a lot of information on why they should not be supported in their practices. But everything doesn't need to be think piece. If someone can make some money from a sponsorship and that means you can pay rent and other bills, okay. As long as they aren't censoring your content, get the bag. Now, some viewers may view that as selling out. Oh, this creator did an ad for AD, Athletic Greens, or Ridge Wallet. They a sellout. Us that have been adults before social media personalities really existed the way they do understand how ads work. Which leads me to a point that might muddy the entire argument I just made. Now, I don't believe athletes have a responsibility to speak on political issues and be leaders, mainly because majority of the time, they uninformed and also pretty young. But if you can use celebrity to bring attention to bigger cause and the people putting the work in and make change as a black person with influence, you owe that. We have two examples. The first is Isaiah Thomas bad boy Detroit Piston legend from the west side of Chicago who was born into a civil rights family thanks to his mother who was on the scene in the movement in the 1960s. You, when you look at the things that we were stepping on the stage talking about like I think it was in 83 or 84 which made it you know real controversial. I said I at that time the only people who were covering our sport were white males. There were no females. There was only one black editor at that time in the United States. Wow. Only one black editor. And everybody who was covering the sport were white men. And I said, I, I did, I, what was my quote? I said, I do, I do not want to be judged or perceived through only the gaze of the white male. That became like, you know, crazy. And then I was vice president of the Players Association at that time. And then I became president of the Players Association. And I said to David Stern, you know, back at, during that time, I said, hey, my, my team's not gonna play until we get, you know, some, they call it diversity now. I said, until we get some black people covering our team. David Stern was like, all right, okay, okay. Now, to this day in Detroit, and if you go back and you look at the Detroit Pistons then, we were the first team that had two African-Americans on the beat, one, two females covering our team, and every beat writer became a columnist mm. from Terry Foster to Drew Sharp, Brian Burwell, Beck Clifton. Then we have Michael Jordan. Jordan was raised in North Carolina in the 1960s. Are you all aware of his famous Republicans buy sneakers too comment, but let me play you all this excerpt from the book, $40 million slaves. Jordan's involvement would have been the tipping point here was a moment when black athletes at his alma mater had stepped off the field to lead a political movement, a model that could have been duplicated at universities all over the country and even in the realm of professional sports. This could have been a pivotal point, the moment when black athletes broke their chains and started speaking their own minds. Jordan, the world's megastar, could have helped ignite a sea change in the role of the black athlete in America. He declined. In the end, Jordan refrained from joining the movement. In fact, he favored the building of a library for family life that had his name on it. He wanted something for all students of all races. This was his signature, the Universal Man. Although eventually the Sonia Haynes Stone Center building was constructed, Jordan's lack of public support was telling. 
at a time when his voice would have strengthened the claims and resolve of the college athletes who would put themselves on the line, he was silent. And if anything, his comments worked against him. This little movement for a black cultural center may seem small, but it could have been the model for how athletes could leverage their power for the larger community. It was a chance for black athletes to show that they understood the difference between reaping the rewards of an unfair system and using their real power to change the system. Instead, Jordan, with one eye on his corporate masters, backed down and stayed on the sideline. A lion on the court, he was a lamb when his community needed him. Michael Jordan was so apolitical. He was afraid for it to even look like he took black people's side because it'd be bad for business. This was in the 1990s. In 1992, Jordan was literally the most famous American athlete, and he helped grow the NBA internationally thanks to the 92 Dream Team. Now, if you read the entire book or just that chapter, it seems that's just how Jordan was. Well, until racism affected him personally, but I'll let you check out the book on your own. All right, so back to the movie. Cassius is able to save his uncle's home seemingly as a payback for holding him down when he was a broke boy. He cops a sweet ass car, but he begins to change without realizing it. He begins using his white voice in casual situations with his girl from Detroit without attending to. His work self and his real self is being blurred. Now speaking of Detroit, like I said, no one in this movie is really purely good or evil. It's at this time we finally see what Detroit's passion is. She holds an art show. The theme is about how Africa has been pillaged for its resources. But her way of doing that is using a British accent dressed in a weird ass bra and panty outfit that I cannot show in this video while reciting lines from The Last Dragon and having batteries and balloons with fake blood thrown at her. And yes, that's the hood classic, The Last Dragon featuring Bruce Leroy. Cell phones can only work with a mineral coltan, which is found in Africa's Congo. The profit involved in this has created hardship and wars. <laughs> Catches bullets with his teeth? Nigga, please. The secret awaits eyes, unclouded by ambition. What? Anyway, after a fight, she basically kicks Cassis out the art show. But the whole thing is reformative. But that's the point. Detroit's argument would be that she's doing this goofy shit by choice and can quit if she wants, while Cassis is a scab. Oh yeah, he's actually a scab. The union movement combines with protests against worry free and Cass along with other power callers had to be escorted in by armed police guards. Now while we speaking of performative, oh yeah baby, we're going there. So one of the things Boots speaks about in interviews is the spectacle of protests and demonstrations and how these replaced work stoppage and labor unions going on strike. And that was also the first time you heard the students are the revolution. It had no historical actual thing. Like not that students hadn't been involved in revolution, but the idea of this new movement that the students are the revolution, the only uh, connection it had to truth was that was the cultural revolution, which was happening at the same time. Um, and, and, but, but other than that, it wasn't, um, it, it, it wasn't true. So you have then, so then you have a different model, which is we're going to create spectacle. We're going to try to use the media, yeah. um, in, in, in certain ways and, and, and create this thing that's kind of this and, and with, then when you subtract the actual organizing around exploitation of labor from it, then it becomes even more amorphous what you're actually fighting for, right? Now, maybe because I'm older and more cynical, maybe because I've been a part of actual community groups that actually had to fuck up a business money and stop their business that wasn't moving right in the community. But... I don't think boycotts work very well. If you don't believe me, go look at Adheiser Bush, the company that owns Bud Light and pretty much like 70% or 40% of all the beer companies out. Or Disney. Whatever the hell other companies, conservatives hit with the go woke or go broke, they're all doing fine. 
The stock is amazing. The CEO still got a hundred million dollar bonus. The internet think piece folks, they do the same thing. You gotta get on TikTok every day to figure out what brand he's supposed to boycott. Don't get a Big Mac. Don't drink Starbucks. Oh, we don't eat Kit Kats because they use Oompa Loompas to harvest chocolate. Companies like Coca-Cola are funding Cop City. Yeah, you can boycott them, but they own about 45% of all soft drink brands. Are you sure that iced tea brand isn't owned by Coca-Cola before you take a picture of it? Because that bottle might be in the background to upset some people. Do any of these things actually work? I don't mean that headline y'all found about boycotts possibly causing a slight decline with Starbucks. I mean, has anyone with a financial background proven these TikTok and social media protests do anything and cause long-term loss forcing change? Or is it all for the spectacle? You can tweet the post how you better than your neighbor with two kids who got them Happy Meals after he worked a 10 hour shift. Or this online liberal creator didn't pass your specific purity test because he's still a Cleveland Indians fan and they didn't retire that racist mascot and change the name sooner. What the movie and actual adults who touch grass and know how the world works is trying to tell you kids is, fucking up the money directly is how you send a message. As many pro Palestine posts as we see and calls for boycotts to send a message we see, it's cute. You know what would really be effective? Is a general strike, or if all the biggest influencers said, if something isn't done by April 20th or whatever date they choose, and all of these 20 something year olds working these jobs are calling off work at McDonald's and Starbucks across the country for the day. If that doesn't work, fine. We'll do it in shifts every single day. Try running a store with one third of the employees. Most of these locations are franchises. They would eventually complain to corporate. Some of you might get fired. Some of you might get arrested for protesting and blocking entry to the store. But let that happen for three days straight. I bet it makes some news. But the thing is, it's kind of like Kendrick Lamar said, niggas blacked out screens and called it solid therapy. That's a reference to when posting hashtag BLM with blacked out screens was the actual thing people did in the 2020 uprisings. Fast forward to 2024, we have kids in the comfort of their home making TikToks about protesting McDonald's and giving, hey guys, I totally support the tag after strikes speeches before YouTube videos for most of 2023. And I'm sorry, it, it all comes off as performative. Then Black Lives Matter protesters brought mansions a few years ago. The people actually doing work in the communities, they struggle to get support for events because the privileged college kids who make these long video essays and these TikTok videos, they don't feel comfortable being around them. And an organic movement has been commodified and monetized while Sean King works on his next scam. But none of this is new. I said in the videos and behind the scenes to other creators. It's the reason Candace Owens appears on the Joe Budden podcast and at breakfast level to talk to uninformed people or get softball questions after years of anti-black propaganda. Because any black person with a sizable platform and actually informed to know, it's no point in talking to a person like her. But honestly, everyone is putting on a performance. I have to up my delivery and emotions up so that you all are watching and make jokes about Oompa Loompas making Kit Kats. Then you have political YouTubers that never talk about sports on Twitter or any other time. All of a sudden, they care when Ja Morant gets suspended for toting guns or Shikari Black gets criticized. Or they wanna pander about women's basketball. Even though, at the time of writing this, the women's Final Four has sold more pre-sale tickets than the men's division has more attention organically, but it doesn't matter. They need to be outraged and have an opinion on something. They don't care about or understand the culture of men's or women's sports. But through all of this, you can't run from how people really see you, which leads us back to the movie and the turning point. So y'all ever been the only black person in a room? It could be at work, in a Zoom meeting, or 
at a Theo Vaughn comedy show. No matter the situation, it's weird as hell. It's even worse when you see another black person, you're like, okay, I'm not alone. But it turns out they don't have your back. They might be a good old boy trying to fit in. That's what happens when Cassis goes to the worry-free, eyes-wide, shut-ass party at the CEO's house. They sit around telling stories. Then the white folks demand Cass tell them some hood stories about living in Oakland. Then make them rap. Now, I'll try to insert a clip. Let's see what happens. If it's not, that means I had to edit it out. Seriously, if you can, support my Patreon so that I don't have to edit this video. Nigga, nigga, nigga shit. Nigga shit, nigga shit. Nigga, nigga, nigga shit. Nigga shit, nigga shit. Nigga, 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 nigga shit. But in case they don't allow me to play this clip, it's known as the nigga shit rap. He literally raps nigga-ish for a minute straight and the crowd goes crazy. Now this is more than the creative scene. It's Boots Riley telling us, this is what a lot of white Americans want from black people. Jay-Z said the same thing in the hook of his record, ignorant shit. And years before Killer Mike won a Grammy, Kendrick Lamar rapped. Critics want to mention that they missed when hip hop was rapping. Motherfucker, if you did, then Killer Mike would be platinum. It's why Kai Sinat, who has Haitian and Trinidadian heritage, is doing his best impersonation of what he think black Americans act like including cosplaying in a jail for a week for entertainment of a mostly young white audience because they love nigga behavior. They love guys like DJ Academics getting drunk on a live stream and attacking black women. It forces us to ask, is your success a byproduct of you telling white audiences exactly what they want to hear? hiding from addressing and promoting black issues, assuring your white viewers that they're the good ones for listening to you, or are you trying to do the opposite? Are you making art that is challenging, taking risks with what you've built, and never forgetting the fact that you still operate in the same system as everyone else does? Are you debasing yourself for white validation? Even when it's not buffoonery, you can still be made to feel like a circus creature. The big homie FD signifier talks about this in his video for Bamboozle. He's the biggest black male creator doing this type of content and he understands to make the money he makes to provide for his family, it requires having a mostly white audience. That's just how things work from an economic point. But he doesn't want to become the wire for white people wanting to learn about racism. Like I said, this video is a spiritual successor to his. While in the movie Bamboozle, it took many months of putting on literal blackface and dancing for a mostly white audience to realize how they view you, the movie Sorry to Bother You achieves the same thing in a modern, more realistic way. It's finally then that Cass realizes they see him as just another nigga. And the only time in the entire movie, Ghost from Power, who's only known as Mr. Blank, they never actually say his last name, breaks character and uses his real voice. He gives Cass to talk about regret and also directions on how to find the CEO's office who wants to meet with Cass. And I tried to warn y'all multiple times about spoilers, but this is when the movie really goes sci-fi. You'll either hate it or love it. So anyway, Cass finds out the real motive of Worry Free after being pressured to snort some white powder he thought would. The workforce of Equisapiens will make Worry Free the most profitable company in human history. And you, our shareholders, will be a part of that history. See? It's all just a big misunderstanding. This ain't no fucking misunderstanding, man. So you making half human, half horse fucking things so you can make more money? Yeah, basically. Very free is turning people into literal horse people so that they can increase profits. They want Cass to be a horse person for a few years, become a fake leader like a horse MLK Jr. Then they'll turn him back into a human once he stops the inevitable horse uprising. Now clearly, it's no reverse horse serum. Hit serum. So Cass is like, uh, nah. Then quits his job and blows the whistle on everything. And by this point in the movie, everything have just gone full 2020 uprisings. Earlier in the movie, one of the protesters hit Cass in the head with a can of soda. That video went super viral. And what started as a legit protest of fighting for human rights has become commodified. 
The girl who threw the can got a sponsorship deal with the soda company. She's making commercials. They sell costumes with afros and soda cans. The whole message has been lost. It's all spectacle now. Cass goes on the show, I got the shit kicked out of me, to talk about the horse people. He then does a talk show circuit, but nothing changes. Worry free stock actually rises and Congress passes laws saying this is all legal, which can be seen as more commentary on the black experience. Countless civil rights activists and everyday black folks got the shit kicked out of them, literally or metaphorically. Only then do the cameras come out to hear what they have to say, and still rarely do laws change. It all concludes with a final push led by Cass and his band of communists to stop worry-free employees from crossing the picket line. Cops show up and beat protesters, arrest Cass, put him in a paddy wagon. Then when all seems lost, the horse people show up. They break Cass out and run off the police. No doubt Worry Free survives because you don't beat capitalism with a single strike or fight. But the movie does end on an upbeat tone. Cass and Detroit move back into his uncle's garage, but it is a little better. It's tricked out with some of the furniture from the condo. He gives a nicer car to his best friend and tries something more humble for himself. In this review, Regal View was able to successfully get a union and Cass will be returning to work for them. Oh. And the closing shot is him getting a horse nose. The guy lied, it actually was horse powder. See, they, they use powder to turn some people into horses. I'm telling you, watch the movie, it makes sense. While the spiritual brother of this movie, Bamboozle, ends with the black radicals executing one of the stars of the menstrual show, then being taken out by police. While Michael Rappaport, the executive of the network, faces no consequences. Like Feek said in this video, it had been almost impossible for Spike Lee to make a movie in which black radicals assassinate the Jewish TV executive. Even though that guy held power, the star of the show could be recasted and they move on like nothing happened. Boots Riley found a workaround. It's a post credit scene where Cass, who is now a complete horse person along with some other horse people, storm the home of the worry-free CEO and stomp his ass out. Now, yes, the next person in line would take over to run the company, but this way the actual one who holds power faces consequences. One of the weirdest movies of the last few years with amazing satire and commentary, I highly recommend watching these movies back to back. And also book series, I'm a Virgo. And if this video does well, I'll cover that series in a similar way. And if you can support my channel on Patreon, and also if you're wondering how someone like Boots Riley with the politics he has could make an anti-capitalism show for Amazon, remember, it's no ethical consumption under capitalism.